it's that time of year. Spirit Halloween stores have appeared everywhere, seemingly out of nowhere, and your kids start planning their candy routes already. Some of you young parents are forced to dress up with your kids, though you'd probably rather not. And that one weird neighbor creates a horror house to scare all the local children. Or maybe you are that weird neighbor. (laughs) The National Retail Federation estimated that about $10 billion was spent on Halloween in 2021. That's billion with a B. And that's only one country. Historically, of course, only English-speaking countries celebrate Halloween. More on that in a minute. Though now, it has gone global. We have now Halloween increasingly being celebrated in other European countries, though that practice is pretty new. And we now have Halloween in places like Japan, China, and around the globe, though each puts their own spin on it culturally. And all of this for a night that's not even a holiday. So let's talk about where this comes from. This subject, the history of Halloween, and subjects like it, is a different branch of history than most people are familiar with. I enjoy it, though it's not my main focus. My focus technically would be called intellectual history, though that term is a little bit overused. But obviously I tend to spend a lot of time discussing the history of ideas. Folk history is what we are doing here. And for some, folk history is either frustrating or exhilarating. I suspect it comes down a lot to your temperament. If you're the kind of person that likes mysteries, where you have to piece together only fragments of information and read between some lines, and you still, in the end, have significant gaps in your knowledge, well, folk history is for you. Rarely do you have chapter and verse to cite when it comes to folk history. Almost always, you are contending against so many urban legends that you wonder if anyone is listening to actual historians on the subject. Everyone knows that one person on social media who around this time of year starts spouting out their vague, internet-assembled philosophy on history and the divine. Halloween works like this. In fact, just about all of our holidays work like this. When you ask where does Halloween or Christmas or Valentine's Day or some other holidays come from historically, you usually cannot get a straight answer, or at least a trained historian can't give you a simplistic answer. Pop culture and people who love to troll each other love simplistic answers, however. We all hear that Saturnalia is the origins of Christmas, even though it's not. Aostra is the goddess of fertility, which gives us Easter, even though no such thing existed, and that's not the origins of Easter. The feasting of pilgrims and Native Americans pleasantly by the fire is where we get popcorn and Thanksgiving. And, of course, Halloween is related to some druidic practice of warding off demon fairies. Real folk history, though, doesn't give us simple answers like this. Folk history, you might say, looks at all the ingredients that, when brought together, are always greater than the sum of their parts. Rather than finding X that marks the spot, where something started and where it comes down to today, it's rather noticing, let's just use the word echoes, or themes, different sensibilities that come down through the centuries, or even over millennia, as in the case of Halloween, to create a modern practice that you really can't pull these things apart. So the history of Halloween is exactly like this. We have several ingredients, not all of them ancient, that make up the story. If I were to ask you, for example, is Halloween a practice that echoes back to the ancient Celtic practices? Or is it a Catholic holiday concerned with remembering the recently departed and praying for souls in purgatory? Or is it a harvest festival celebrating the coming of fall and the end of summer? Is it the product of Victorian horror literature and Hollywood? Is it a night of drunken parties and debauchery? Is it associated with neo-pagans like Wiccans and others in the modern world? Or is it a wildly expensive night for parents as they burn money on costumes and candy? The answer is yes. And that's how folk history works. By the way, I could do the same thing for Christmas. Is it secular, celebrating elf culture? Is it part of the Catholic liturgy? Is it part of American culture and other cultures as they add their own flavors along the way? Yes, all the way down the line. And don't even get me started on Valentine's. So what I want to do here is give you the big picture. 
I want to do a little bit of folk history and tell you the story of Halloween and all of these little ingredients that make up the modern practice. I'm not going to get into the question of should you participate in Halloween? What's your opinions? Is it dangerous? Is it too much for young kids to see all the spooky stuff? That type of thing. The question here is rather where does it come from? How do we go from something that is several thousand years old all the way down until today where you have candy corn and pumpkins and a lot of modern practices? Okay, let's start quickly with some of the more mythical story of the origins of Halloween. You can find this usually online, sort of pop culture ways of describing Halloween. But the normal way that you hear it is something like the following. The ancient Celtic peoples of Ireland used to celebrate Sowen. And yes, it's spelled Samhain or Samhan, but it's pronounced Sowen. And Sowen was the night when the door to the other world opened and the fey creatures entered the mortal world. Wraiths and demons and shadowy things that go bump in the night. And they dressed up in skins to ward off the evil spirits. November 1 was the Celtic New Year, and so this was the night of darkness and spiritual danger. And according to that same pop history, the Catholic Church comes along and they just say, hey, why not? And they adopt the same practices into the liturgical calendar, and they start calling it All Saints Day. Instead of warding off the demons, they're now somehow praying for the souls of those dead. And so November 1 becomes All Hallows Day, or All Saints Day, and the eve, the day before that, is All Hallows' Eve, or Halloween. That's about the big picture you often hear. It was pagan, centered around Druids offering blood sacrifices and the Catholics just syncretistically took it on as part of their practice. But I think it's pretty obvious there's a lot missing in that story. But for some, that quick synopsis, that pop history, is enough to make them forever enemies of Halloween. When that Ninja Turtle and that Disney princess ring the doorbell, they shut off the light. Might as well open the door and tell the Druids to get off your doorstep. (laughs) Okay, maybe that's a bit much. But there are some who can't believe Halloween is anything but ancient demon worship. A lot of this myth comes from, frankly, one person, and that's where we're going to start. A man by the name of Charles Valency, a British civil engineer in the 1760s, is the origin of a lot of this type of demon worship idea. He was stationed in Ireland, and he was enamored with what he assumed was Celtic culture. And despite not being a scholar, he wrote a rather terribly researched and laughably written book on the primordial origins of the Celtics. I don't have time to go into this too much, but historians of Halloween often either laugh or hate this book because it gives us so many of the big myths that are often repeated online. The biggest howler is he mistook Sewin for the worship of a deity called Balsab, the Lord of Darkness. And he said that around Sewin, or what we would call Halloween, the Celtic peoples are worshiping this Lord of Death. The problem is that the name Balsab, or Lord of Death, appears in no ancient text, and there is no reason to have said this. We are still a bit mystified as to where this comes from in his writings, but it does seem to confuse the ancient Mesopotamian deity Baal, which you sometimes see in the Old Testament, Baal worship, and he seems to have brought that into Celtic history. Baal Saab is Baal, Lord, Saab, death. And that speaks a bit to the problem here, which I'm about to go into, which is this must have come from something dark and sinister. So if we find the origins of something dark and sinister, that's the smoking gun. The problem, though, is that nearly all the practices related to Halloween today, save only the date, derive from either Christian medieval practice or from modern American history. It doesn't come from Baal Saab or things like this, at least not fundamentally. So, for example, in this video so far, I've shown lots of pictures of things we associate with Halloween. Pumpkins, corn, candy, trick-or-treaters. But all of these are American inventions, and pretty recent ones, too. So the fact that all of this is associated with Halloween, and yet it only arrives in the New World, should tell you a bit that Halloween is as much modern as it is ancient. So what I want to say is that simply telling one part of the story, the part of sewing and trying to make it entirely Celtic, is a bit like saying that a cake is nothing but eggs, simply because it has eggs in it. In folk history, it's the mixture of the ingredients that matters most. Yes, sewing is part of the story, and I'm going to tell that story. But in fact, Hollywood and American culture are the more dominant factors when it comes to the rise of Halloween. Okay, I haven't gotten all that out of the way. Let's go through the actual ingredients that make up Halloween. The academic study of Halloween is actually a phenomenon that's pretty new. It's about 30 or 40 years old. 
but we have a fairly strong grasp on all the different ingredients. First, we do have a vague history of the Celtic practices surrounding the celebration of Samhain. And when I say vague, I don't mean that condescendingly. Second, we have the development of Catholic liturgical practices in the calendar over about a thousand years, and it gave rise to what we today would call Hallowtide, or the celebration of the saints and praying for the dead in purgatory. Third, we have colonial American culture, which eradicates major portions of the history and makes it more about harvest festivals. Fourth, you have the influx of Irish and Scotch-Irish into the New World, and with them comes the old cultural legacy of Sowen. And fifth, you have the rise of the modern middle class, pop culture, horror movies, candy corns, and the start of this costuming, trick-or-treating practice that kids love today. There are twists and turns to each of these pieces of the story, and each has an opportunity to go really deep. I'm not going to do that, though. I just want to give you the big picture and to point to the ways that this history is, again, a bit more of an echo down through time and show how the practice of Halloween is a mixture of lots of different elements. Okay, first, Celtic history. When we discuss Celtic history, we need to have a bit of caution here. As I've said in other videos, the Celtics were not simply Irish, though they later would be associated with Irish heritage. But as far back as the writings of Julius Caesar in his History of the Gallic War, there's always been only a vague understanding of those tribes to the north. And I don't mean that we know nothing, but the Keltoi, as the Romans called them, spread throughout much of modern Ireland, Britain, and down into Germany and France. They are the general people who lived north of the Roman boundaries. And they were some of the so-called barbarians who later came to conquer Rome in later centuries. They left no writings, though they probably were literate. And more importantly, most of what we know about them is written down later by Christian missionaries in the high to later Middle Ages. It's quite a bit of a gap between their existence and the writing down of their heritage. What we know about their practice in Ireland specifically, however, does relate to Halloween. The Celtic people there were, of course, pagan, believing in a variety of deities. They were led in their practice by an elite class of Druids, though you have to see Druids in the Celtic world less as Dungeons and Dragons and more as, say, the royal and spiritual advisors in the court of Pharaoh. They were equally in charge of giving counsel to the king as they were of performing rituals and sacrifices. The Celtic afterlife was called the Land of Summer, and the passage between summer and autumn was a big deal for their culture. And that day was sundown October 31st, or Sowen. On that night, the passage between the afterlife and the mortal world opened up. So that part of Sowen is true, this idea that October 31st is when the spiritual creatures, largely negative, come into our world. But it was more than just a spiritual time. Sowen was also a harvest festival, to use our language, for the Celtic people. I often point out that for those who think that harvest festival is somehow less Celtic or pagan than Halloween, well, I'm sorry, they're all pagan, at least if you want to point to the origins of these types of things, the celebration of the end of summer and the passing into autumn. But this was a time for slaughter and a great feast, and probably, as one historian pointed out, the only time that most Celtic people had access to alcohol. It was a wild night, to say the least. It was also a politically important night. There was, for example, a gathering at Tara, sort of a seat of kings for Celtics back then, where a giant bonfire and rituals were performed. Judgments would also be rendered against enemies, people who had committed crimes and the like, and those who were found guilty were executed. There were also sport and festivals, laughter, the young and unmarried flirting, looking for a potential partner. In my mind, I don't know why, I always have that image from the scene of the movie Brave, where all the kings are drinking and sporting and handling business and trying to find suitors for marrying the young I mean, the movie is based in Scotland, it kind of fits. That's what Sowen would have been more like. Equal parts raucous party, politically important gathering of political leaders, and a story of magic and fairy creatures, and the spirits of those around them. The big bonfire that the Druids tended was also a form of attacks. People would extinguish the hearth fires at their homes, and they would come to Sowen, and they would pay their yearly tax to the Druids, and receive an ember from which they would go back and light the hearth again. 
sort of a convenient way of taking a census, keeping track of everybody, and making sure that everybody pays their due. In other words, October 31st for the Celtic people was more than just spooky goblins and warding off the dead, and that's the important factor. We spend way too much time talking about the other world opens up and all these spirits come in, and they would dress up in animal skins and the like in order to ward this off. It's more than that. It is significantly important for the Celtic people. It is a time where they gather and have a festival, you might say. It was culturally rich, with everything from merriment to mischief to blood sacrifice. And that's the important thing that a lot of pop history doesn't understand. You can remove the pagan practice of druid worship, blood sacrifice, and many of these elements, and still retain the cultural importance of Soen for the Celtic people. And that, in fact, is essentially what happens when the Catholic faith came to Northern Europe. By the 7th century, after the work of St. Patrick in the 6th century, of course, St. Patrick is the patron saint of the Irish, Ireland and other countries to the north become Catholic. Like many countries north of Rome, however, including the Scandinavian regions, Germanic, and Frankish tribes, certain cultural practices were still held on to. It's a bit like saying if you remove the religion, you still have essentially a 4th of July party around the time of October 31st. Now, yes, it's very simplistic, but the cultural significance of that night and those parties and those gatherings remains long after Ireland and Britain become Christian. But also within the Catholic Church, you have the evolution, you might say, of the liturgical calendar. About the mid-8th century, Pope Gregory III moved the traditional Feast of Martyrs to November 1st. This feast was a memorial day for those who had died for the faith in the ancient church. However, two things are at play here. First, November was, as one scholar said, the most boring time in the Roman calendar. There just was not a lot going on. Meanwhile, the Celtic folks and those of the north are continuing their history of celebrating the end of summer with essentially a cultural harvest festival. So Gregory officially makes All Saints Day as it came to be known November 1st. Moving dates around like this, by the way, is not a big deal in the Middle Ages. November 2nd, then about the year 1000, becomes All Souls Day. It's a long process in that happening, but it becomes another day in the calendar. So that what happens is that by the 1300s, a very long time, mind you, after the conversion of Ireland and Britain, you now have what we call Hallowtide. But notice how relatively late and how relatively un-Celtic a lot of the history of Hallowtide has become. It's actually heavily Catholic. There is certainly some of what we would call syncretism, or the mixing of pagan and Christian elements here. Though it is questionable how some simply say, well, Celtic paganism is the same as medieval praying to the saints. It shouldn't take much to realize the difference between blood sacrifice and warding off spooky demons is different than a Catholic mass where you're praying for the dearly departed in purgatory on their way to heaven. I find some of that to be a bit disingenuous. It takes a modern sort of cynicism to say that, well, all engagement with the spiritual afterlife must be the same and it must be pagan in origins. There is, however, a practice in the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages of what you might call taking over, or you might even call it conquesting the pagan world. Famously, it was believed that whenever you convert an area to Christianity, you don't knock down their pagan shrines, rather you go in there, take out everything that is pagan, and put a cross and an altar up. There's a sort of, this is our land now, our church now, and these are our dates now. I question whether or not that's fully syncretism or not. Also, by the time of the Renaissance, which is about where we are now, you don't really have a lot that we would call modern Halloween yet, other than the dates. You have a time of remembering those who have passed, you have a time of praying for the dead in purgatory, and you have, for those in Britain and Ireland, a cultural heritage of Soen that has now become a time of mischief and partying and a big bonfire. But throughout most of Europe, there is nothing that is associated with what we would today call Halloween in its sort of fine details. The one thing that is close is something called souling. And this is a practice where children would go around singing, knocking on doors, and asking for treats or ale or something like this on All Hallows' Eve. Think of it a bit as a cross between trick-or-treating and caroling. Kids want the good stuff, they go around knocking on a holy day. And by the way, people act like that is something abnormal. That happened on all holy days. <laughs> That's often forgotten. A holy day was when you were supposed to be actually generous to the least of those around you, giving alms and giving food out to those in need. 
Chodun liked to go a begging, so to speak. But it's not exactly trick or treating. It's souling, but it's very similar, and it's around this same time of year. So, to summarize at this point, you have the ancient Celtic practice of sowing, the Catholic Church converts, those regions become Catholic, but the cultural memory of sowing remains. The calendar then gets developed to where those same dates become an important time of the memory of those who have died. And so they become high holy days. You had a practice of souling and ringing of bells, and it was, you might say, a several days off and a bit of a raucous time. There would be drinking and feasting, but it's not Halloween as you and I know it. So where did that come from? Okay, so looking at the modern practice of Halloween, we're going to start making some jumps here. There's a lot that I'm going to skip over, but again, I'm staying big picture. For example, there's Guy Fawkes Night, November 5th, which my friends in Britain still celebrate today. Another big bonfire, another big festival around the same time. There's also little twists and turns in Scottish and Irish history. There's lots of pieces in their heritage about Halloween remain. What I want to jump to, though, is the question of how does this liturgical practice in Catholic Europe come to the New World in America which for most of its history has very, very anti-Catholic tendencies. It's very strange if you think about it that way. Not a lot of people notice that jump. Halloween is Catholic because it's related to All Saints Day and All Souls Day, and you have to be Catholic to be praying for those in purgatory. How does jolly old Protestant America start to take this on? So I want to talk about that real quick. The simple answer is that colonial America strips Halloween, or that first week of November, of all of its Catholic sensibilities. It's worth remembering that those who first came to the colonies were not Catholic. In fact, they were almost universally staunchly anti-Catholic. As I'm going to say in a minute, this will change. But the important part of the story is that what happens to Halloween in America is not that it's a pagan holiday that takes root in the New World. Rather, it's a formerly Catholic practice, part of the liturgical calendar, that in America loses all of its traditional Catholic flavor. Also, as you can imagine, it loses its British and Irish flavor in the colonial days as well, as the new ferment of American pride begins to grow. There were few to no Irish immigrants in those early days, and so anything that would be traditionally Celtic was very minimal. In other words, in America, Halloween in the colonial days is stripped of almost all of its traditional practices. This happens, by the way, with Christmas as well. That's another video, that's another conversation, but Puritan New England, for example, outlawed both of these days. No Halloween, no Christmas, no fun. What America did excel at, though, was an appreciation for the fall harvest. Looking ahead, this is where the idea of Thanksgiving will also start to come about. Most cultures do this, by the way. The end of summer, we live in a day of supermarkets and easy food, so it's easy to forget just how important harvest is. But what begins to happen is, is as the fall harvest idea in America begins to take shape, some of the things that we will eventually associate with Halloween are all American. Pumpkins, corn, these types of things are all native to the New World. But in American colonial days, this is wrapped up in the idea of the harvest. However, by the 1800s, you start to have for the first time Irish and Scottish immigrants coming over and bringing with them the more raucous, fun-loving ideas associated with Halloween and so on. So the American practice of harvest festivals now gets injected with a more Irish sensibility of the heritage of the past. It still doesn't take on Catholic elements, but the cultural Irish elements do come into play. And so it is in the 19th century that some of the more mischievous elements of Halloween start to come about. Those Irish pranksters would come over and on Halloween night would start to pull trick-or-treat pranks. It's just part of the old world coming to the new. And with the rise of Catholics in America, which begins about the same time, you do have a greater appreciation in America for the Hallowtide season. But Halloween is now its own thing. It's neither pagan nor Catholic. It is now part of Americana, you might say. And of course, yes, I'm leaving out a lot of history of Britain and Ireland during the same time, but I'm focusing on America right now. The last two ingredients in this are the two that become the most immediately recognizable for modern folks. First and foremost, you have the rise of the horror genre in entertainment. We often call this Victorian Gothic, this is the late 1800s, or the Victorian horror literature genre. And it's easy to forget how common horror movies and scary movies and spooky ghost stories and entertainment of this kind 
are for us today. But this comes from the Victorian era. Frankenstein's monster and Dracula are the two most commonly recognizable stories from that period, but there are plenty of others. And then, with the rise of Hollywood, the natural thing was to bring some of that Victorian horror genre onto the big screen. And that form of entertainment has been with us ever since. And so, over time, horror movies became associated with the fall. It wasn't pagan, it was entertainment-driven. And lastly... It is only in the 1900s, the 20th century, with the rise of the middle class after the world wars and the increased consumer spending that happens that you finally get the crystallization of Halloween. Celebrations of the fall were common, only now we have suburbs, and that agrarian life is largely lost. But we have the rise of the entertainment industry, and we have this middle class that wants to have fun rites of passage, fun moments for their children, and the practice of trick-or-treating around the time of Halloween began to grow as well. Probably the earliest is in the early 1900s, but it quickly catches on. As I said when my kids were young, they like to dress up and eat candy every day of the year, and the fact that there's one day of the year where they can do it without any problem was a ok in their book. But it's around the 1950s, the Leave it to Beaver age, where you have the mass production of Halloween costumes, where you have trick-or-treating, and you have this concept that the suburban life is one on Halloween where you go around to the neighbors, you knock on doors, and in a very polite way, you get candy. But built into it as well is this spooky idea that is driven by Hollywood and entertainment. And needless to say that by the 1950s, most of the long twists and turns throughout history, from Sewin to medieval Catholics to the Renaissance to colonial America, had been largely lost. Now, in the 1900s, Halloween was, in American culture, its own thing. And now, in the 21st century, the idea that October 31st is a time of dress-up, partying, candy, fun with your kids, is all but cemented. Okay, so this has been a big picture of the story of Halloween. You can go into the comments and list all kinds of things that I've left out. There's tons. But this is what folk history is. The story of Halloween is more of a story of lots of different ingredients going down through history that make up the modern practice. From one vantage point, Halloween is modern. Candy corn, superhero costumes, Tim Burton movies, and the like. But there's a long history that goes back hundreds if not thousands of years. <laughs> 